Welcome to a new episode of Art Matters. I'm Wayne Quackenbush, your host. Today we're on location in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. We're here with uh, architect and artist Gary Graham in his studio. And Gary, oh, welcome to the show and thanks for having us at your house. And Welcome to the studio. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and You've been on quite an adventure the last five years or so with uh, doing a lot of watercolors. You want to talk a little bit about what got you started with that? Well, I, I mean, it, it can go way back. Yeah, um, we can do as, that. As, as, a, as a trained as an architect, actually, mm -hmm. um, way long time ago at the University of Virginia, we had kind of a Beaux Arts training um, in our in our uh, educational process, and so we were. I've learned to do washes and, and watercolor renderings and things like that, but at, at least at the very earliest stages of my career. You probably had the equivalent of a foundation course where you had to kind of dabble in everything. That, that, that was what we, we you did. Specialize in your architecture. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, architecture, I mean, we learn how to draw. Nowadays, nowadays they don't so much. I mean, because of the computer. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, and we also um, learn some level of media uh, and composition and those kinds of things. And but but basically, I've been a practicing architect for the last uh, fifty years. Right, and practicing means that occasionally doing a lot of drawing with not a lot of painting. No, yeah, li literally. And I, I think um, I, I from the time that I actually did a watercolor on the beaches of uh, Spain uh, when I was 21, right. many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and between the end until about five or six years ago, I may have painted five times. <laughs> you know, so I really, I wasn't a, uh, an active painter. And I was a, a very active architect and, and, uh, and frankly still am, still right. have a practice. Right. And you're also teaching a lot. Uh, well, I, yeah, uh, I, that's one reason we're in Rhode Island. Uh, we were living in up in Boston, Newton, uh, mm -hmm. Newton area, and uh, we we came down. I was uh, adjunct teaching at Roger Williams University's architecture program, and about uh, now in 2008, um, I became a full-time tenured professor uh, uh -huh. of our, or our associate professor of architecture. Yep. And uh, so, and, and teaching, and frankly, uh, interesting, I mean, because uh, when I had studio courses, uh, though that was the time that basically reintroduced my sense of drawing. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I, I had to communicate with students, and, and I used to take a bunch of uh, yellow, yellow tracing paper and, 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 uh, and just sit there with my students, and, and, uh, and I, I, found, I found I was really enjoying the drawing. Sure. Um, and uh, which, you know, I mean, there's a lot of non, you know, kind of artistic aspects of being an architect, but, uh, but that, that was really, that was really nice. Sure. And then seven years ago, you, uh, were you on a trip or you, you... We made a commitment, actually. I said, I don't want to take a workshop. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so Susie and I, uh, my wife and I, went to a workshop up in Land Grove, Vermont, um, uh, put on by a friend of hers named Margie Samuels, who's mm -hmm. quite a good teacher, and she's actually taught at the Park with Art Guild. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and that was a workshop, and then it was another year went by, and then we went to a second workshop in Land Grove. We, we enjoyed her, we enjoyed Enjoyed the food. We enjoyed the location. Oh, it must have been fun. It must have been oh, like going on retreat. Uh, Land Grove is wonderful, yeah. and they, 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 and they, and they built their program. So now they have, you know, really very well-known ar uh, artists come mm -hmm. to teach for a week, or basically four-day periods. Yeah. And then the year after that, so, and, then, and then nothing happened. You know, I, I didn't paint at all, and then nothing happened. And then we went to a. Um, we said, well, let's be more adventurous, and so we went to a. I was looking online, and, and there was a, a program in uh, Oia, Portugal. Um, that was put on, uh, and, and the, the artist's name was Graham Booth, mm -hmm. um, who didn't know anything about him really, but uh, sounds okay, let's, let's do that. So we went to, uh, for a workshop with um, Graham Booth in Portugal, uh, and, and that really was where my kind of, kind of re-emergence into uh, uh, very committed to just watercolor. Now, was it his teaching, or the, or the location, or the combination? I, I was. It was. It was. Well, it was a wonderful. You know, I, I found that the workshops are, are really wonderful for us. I mean, it, it, it's social, uh, it's skill building, um, and uh, and and it's you know in a tourism, I guess. I mean, you get to go to sure. a really neat place sure. and, and, and live there for four or five days, and, and kind of really feel like you become a little bit more. You know, kind of associated with what's going on. Yeah, and and 
since I've known you, you've been very, very avid and active. And uh, you, for instance, you just told me that you do a weekly session with your grandchildren <laughs> through Zoom. <laughs> And well, this is Monday for us. I don't know when it will air, but uh, and well, yeah, uh, that was uh, that was yeah. And, and well, tonight um, at uh, seven thirty, uh, which is four thirty LA time, where right. my my grandkids are, uh, we will put our I get my camera set up and my, my work area, and and, uh, and we'll paint something together. Now you and, never you didn't do this before the pandemic, though. Oh, nothing, no, nothing. You learned, you nothing learned like new skills since then, but you also participate in the Portsmouth challenges on the Facebook page. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. also uh, do plein air with uh, the crowd. I do. I do. Yes. There's Portsmouth a, Arts Guild. On, you go on, on location. Sundays we, we go out and weather almost no matter the weather weather and uh, and we'll go. And even in the winter time you were doing it from your car. Which That's correct. Is amazing. And parking in the side of the road or in a parking lot and just painting inside your car with the heat go on and the engine going. Yeah. But that's that's a lot of dedication. Now we need to start looking oh, at some oh. of your work. All right. Um, well, we'll talk about a, a uh, well, plein air. Um, so now plein air is, for in case you need <laughs> to know, is uh, basically just painting outdoors from nature. And and so. Oh, this is about a month ago now. Um, we went. We Hold went. Hold it vertically so okay, can Michael see? can see it. Uh, we went to a little park in Providence. I know I forget the name of it. Um, and uh, just there was four of us, I think, painting that day. And and uh, and I painted uh, this 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 scene, mm -hmm. uh, which is a scene in Providence and overlooking the buildings. Uh, and interestingly. Um, Right after that, the, the, the Portsmouth Arts Guild Challenge was a very similar picture. Yes. You know, cause so, so there's, the, oh, well, not this one, but... Uh, we do, uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of landscapes. But, and but, uh, that was a church steeple. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, And, and uh, this was pretty much in the middle of winter. Yep. Um, this is this is a scene over at Colt State Park where they have the stables, um, yes. and it was a cold day. But we just parked the car uh, right in this location, uh, and this was one of the uh, the PAG. Or this was this happened to be a uh, plein air painting. So, so that's how I catalog everything. I have they're they're, they're either plein air or and, and I take lots of workshops online also. Right. You know, which I can. You know. Absolutely. Oh, well, here's here's a. Just an example of a PAG challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, this challenge was probably within the last two months or so, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think the theme was more of a, a, a rural scene. And, and I, I actually, I think, I may have put this in the the recent uh, um, show that was uh, City and Country. Oh, right. City and yeah. Country. Yeah. Actually, the show there's that. I have to say, Wayne, I, I, since March, last March, I've painted at least a hundred paintings. So I'm going so <laughs> like to say. <laughs> I've, I've got, I've got a lot. Two paintings a week. I probably, I started doing something every day, but I, I got too busy. So oh. now, I'm, now I've only done three or four paintings in the last, well. I did want to show this one, actually. This, this is um, the um, Cutler Mill, and, and again, uh, from the car, plein air um, in, in the kind of uh, midwinter, uh, and uh, this was, you know, we're, we're having a lot of fun. Our, our, our plein air group is, does have a lot of fun on the, on the, the Sunday afternoon and so forth. Let me, let me show you an example of a, a painting that um, I did with my, my kids out in California. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is a, a scene on, uh, I believe it's um, Malibu Beach or someplace like that. This is one of those lake guard, guard shacks. Um, and uh, their, their, um, their grandmother had taken some photographs that were very similar to this painting. And so we, re we really had a nice time with this particular subject. It was right. really, really, really pleasant kind of thing. Um, oh, can I, let me mention, so, so the, um, over the course of the uh, COVID era, I mean, I, I've, I've really enjoyed my exposure to a, just a number of artists and in, 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 on Zoom classes. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if it will continue after 
you know, when, while we're, when things get back to normal, because, I mean, it's so easy to, I mean, this is, a, this is again, that my... my um, well, it's the potential to working with people from different areas of the country right. and the world. In the world. I mean, I think people like you are just learning uh, to make use of that, because you don't have to be in the same room to communicate. I know you lose a lot from not being in the room with people, but... Uh, it's a great substitute. Well, so this is my, my guru, the, the guy Graham Booth, mm -hmm. um, and this was, he had a series of, um, two series of six-week workshops um, that ran for basically a week each, and uh, this was one of, one of the, the subjects for the week, and, and he, he just, I mean, if I could learn to, you know, be able to express myself artistically and, and uh, you know, the way he does, I mean, I would be very, very happy. Mm -hmm. is, and so that's, that's the kind of thing that, that, uh, that we do. So how long do you usually sit to do one of your paintings? I'm sure it varies, obviously, by subject matter. Um, yeah, you know, it doesn't, I mean, okay, so there's, there's like four, four major steps to, to mm -hmm. the process for me. Yeah. Um, one is the composition, you know, kind of assessing what a good photograph is or a good scene is if you're mm -hmm. plein air uh, to use. Uh, the second is the drawing. Okay, so and, and and so I'll probably spend more time on the drawing, I mean literally probably more time on the drawing than the painting practically. Um, so to get the, the proportions correct, the perspective lines right, to make sure that it's you know re really feeling correct, I, I, I will spend some time on the drawing. So that's that's the architect in you. You're building the yeah. skeleton, and, and then yeah, the I, I, I think for, again for, for I know me, watercolors that just start throwing paint. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's not me. No, <laughs> I, I, I need I need to have the structure of the drawing. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then, that you were able to talk the, about that. And then the next step, which is one that I've learned from my gurus and teachers, um, is that first wash. So watercolor, you know, basically and. and I think what I really learned a long, long time ago, you left a lot of white and so forth. So dark is what really is necessary. You don't need to leave white, white whites unless right. there's, sometimes there's a re reason to do it, but rarely, rarely. And so the first wash is that, that next step in the process, and that's where you're getting a mood. A lot of times it includes the sky. Uh, the sky, you may not have to go back in if you, if you get the back sure. right the first time. A little bit of little bit of uh, value in the colors, and that's that's the first wash. Are you wetting the whole paper? The whole thing, yeah. all from top to bottom. Are the you whole using thing. a spray bottle or brush? No, no, uh, it's a brush. It, it'll it'll I'll usually use a fairly large brush. I yep. use I have a Hake brush that I, I like to use actually that that carries a lot of water, and you just kind of and it's it's messy a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, and you let it dry, and then the next phase is when you begin to incorporate the values and, and, sure. and shapes and the forms and, and I, I work pretty hard at, at getting uh, that correct and because the final stage is the detail and, and the de you know I, I, and I always look at paintings and in the middle of the process it you know I, God do, am I going to finish this I mean it's terrible <laughs> yeah I know the feeling yeah you know and then you start to get the details and you start to and, and, and all of a sudden oh together. it's working you know I mean and, and yeah. so that, that's that's amazing that really is I guess that's actually, one of the joys of running out of time right. here. Okay, sorry. So that's <laughs> okay. Um, I think that we've gone as far as we can go right now, and I okay. really appreciate your time. Well, I enjoy it, and I enjoy. Uh, thank you for this, and yeah, thank you for promoting art in the community. I just think it's great. And well, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's good. We're here with uh, author. Jeff Medeiros, and we'll be talking about his new book. We don't often have authors on the show. I think it's the first one that's actually gone to cable. So let's get the show on the road. So welcome, Jeff. It's been a while since we talked to you. You've never actually been on the cable version of the show, so we're going to introduce you to a possibly wider audience. Uh, and you're here to talk about your latest venture. Um, following up uh, with another anthology of horror stories, the first one being Midnight Creeps and Gargoule. So what's, what's up and what's new with you? 
Well, I was very <clears throat> excited to keep this ball rolling and do the second uh, collection of short stories, which does have some uh, connections to the first book. There's mm -hmm. some sequels and stuff, so I had a lot of fun with that. But not only that, uh, artist Sasha Kuznetsov again did all the illustrations for all the new stories. Like so, more than 20, right? Oh, I believe there were 33 of them this time, yeah. Uh, only 11 stories in this collection, but... Well, you have a plan for a future fully illustrated edition. I do, yes. Yeah. And uh, it's funny to be talking about an artist and the artist not being here, but this is all tied into your work and his work is very much inspired by your stories. Right. Now, you have a very distinct uh, acknowledgement to Edgar Allan Poe in your work. And so would you say that he's your biggest inspiration? Absolutely. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for him. Mm -hmm. Him and Lovecraft really are my main influences. And both of them have spent spent some time in uh, New England and, and yeah, absolutely. as far as I remember your stories are based there. There might be a couple European connections but a lot of them are. A lot of locations that people would be familiar with in Rhode Island specifically. Yes, this one, uh, there's a couple that are, are set in New Hampshire, there's one that's set in Newport, so. Yep. Now, did you want to give us a sample and then we can look at some artwork? Sounds good. And you have a box there, you might want to hold that up so mm -hmm. our kids at home can see what you brought with you. <laughs> That's a fairly evil laugh. <laughs> and what's right. the title of this work you'll be this reading one, an excerpt from? This one's the one that's set in Newport and it's called The Vials. Mm -hmm. That would be V-I-A-L-S. No, V-I-L-E-S. Oh, that's, that's you, you even worse. You would a automatically <laughs> think of, you know, a... Elixirs? Yes, exactly. But no, but. you're just you're, you're thinking of something <laughs> very horrible, I'm sure. Oh, you know it. So have at it. Thank you. It's called The Vials. Morty was dumbfounded, to say the least. What the hell is happening, he wondered to himself. He had never before heard anything like this. Then he recalled some of the strange old man's words on the tower in his dream and began to wonder if they were not true. He, ex he examined the face on the female doll. He saw not a hole or a slot in which a bug could crawl through, only red painted lips wrapped around a dark splotch. He scratched his head and lit a smoke. Come on now, old girl. Let's stop misbehaving and get back to work. I just heard of a place on the dock that serves shrimp Mozambique and it ain't free. He carefully popped Mrs. Stitches back in her spot among the others before he gathered up the projectiles for the next player with a couple of coins. About 10 minutes, it seemed that no one was interested in the knockovers booth until finally a man handed his young son a bit of change and soon had a ball in his hand ready to throw. He concentrated for a while before he let it go. He was sure he had hit his target, yet instead of watching it topple, it did not fall. However, it seemed closer than before. Hmm, that's funny, said the boy. I was sure I had hit it. He stared at his target with intensity before the second throw. Again, he was confident that he was spot on with the shot, and he was sure he had folded it over for it was no longer standing with the others. For a second, a smile appeared on the boy's face, yet it was quickly twisted into a mask of terror, for it was no longer standing with the others. For a second, he thought he had hit it off the table and now, and was now standing on the counter only inches before him. He screamed as he turned to flee, yet 
After only four or five steps, he suddenly froze in mid-run. What is it now? cried the father. Look, Dad, look down, pointing at a spot of pavement surrounded by many shoes stood the very same doll which spooked him from the counter. The father cursed and the crowd screamed and began to brewing up a panic as the child was suddenly lifted off the ground and hurled through the sky as if he were riding on a violent hurricane wind. His body spun limply as it rose over the booths lined up on the opposite side. Incredibly he was thrown not only a great distance, but he also reached a height of some 35 feet. His poor body stopped as it slammed into the side of the Ferris wheel. Landing inside one of the chairs, folks were now heard screaming from the top of the ride as the lighted monstrosity slowly spun, the bulbs of which were now beginning to blink oddly for the first time ever. As if the unbelievable insanity the crowd witnessed wasn't enough of a strain on their senses, they watched in surmounting terror as the boy's body dropped from one chair as the wheel turned only to land in one of the lower chairs, setting more people screeching with madness and disgust. The father froze like a statue with his head turned up, his jaw wide and his eyes climbing out of their sockets. All he and everyone else could do was watch in complete disbelief as the boy's body either kept spilling out of the basket it landed in, or it was pushed off the laps of the frightened passengers only to fall into yet another set of chairs. It happened several times as the giant wheel made a complete revolution before the operator could stop it prematurely. Morty was as disturbed and devastated as the boy's father about the troubling events. Again, he found himself thinking about the words of the strange man in his dream. He too seemed frozen and disconnected as the crowd around fled out of the park as fast as they could move. Some of them were trampled as the roar of the crying crowd grew louder. But all was now completely silent in Morty's head. He had tuned out the sounds of the mayhem. In that moment, nothing made sense anymore. All he heard now was the repeated words of, of the tomb looter. And he knew he was indeed losing all control of his little lovelies at last. He felt a swirling in his gut then, for he knew the game was up. The quick and easy way he had made his coin for many years was now gone. He'd have to find himself a complete new gig, starting from scratch, maybe even stoop as low as to get a real job. The mere thought of such a thing made him evil. He was next to broke and found himself wondering if he was not in some kind of trouble. Yow! Well, that was, uh, certainly took an unexpected turn. <laughs> <laughs> you want to show us some of Sasha's work? I'd love to. And you could talk about the, the stories a little bit. This one is the Barnacles of Aqua House. Now this one is about an eccentric seafarer, a captain who lives on an island, a secluded island, uh, otherwise uninhabited, and he has an exhibit of these sea monsters and creatures that he's brought up from the depths of the ocean and all this mayhem ensues as people go to visit the place and check out the creatures in his exhibit. Okay, we'll switch it out because we're running out of time. This next one is called the Little Yaogwai, which is a Chinese word that means demon. This is actually um, a prequel to the homunculus. Which that was in the first uh, Midnight Creeps book. Yes. And 
One more. This story is called The Ickling Tree. And it's a story of a a young, well, it's a story of a woman who claims when she was a young girl that a tree not only tried to consume her, but ate her brother and her dog. And <laughs> that's pretty much the, the gist of it without giving too much of the story away. It makes you wonder if people disappear in the trees all the time. Yes. The thing is, it's not actually a tree, uh -huh. but I won't say anything more than that. Bitcoin, that's a good, good name for it. So are you making progress in make, getting towards a publication date? I haven't yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only a matter of money, really. Yep, yep. When I'm done with uh, the audio book for the Midnight Creeps, that's when I'll start. So. Yeah, I guess we're getting close to that then too. Huh? Yeah. Very yeah, good. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully, it'll be out within about a year or so. And are you still writing? Yeah, absolutely. Any more ghost phenomena in your house? Uh, you know that has calmed down a lot, really. Yeah, I showed you some of the orbs that were flying that was, around. That was very uh, fascinating. Yes. Well, Jeff, I'm glad you took time out of your day and came and talked to us. And uh, Me too. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Great to see you. And that wraps up another episode of Art Matters. Thanks for joining us. Um... Yeah, I, I always like the idea of, of weird tales, and I think that's why I do what I do. I mean, I like to um, write in the distant past you know, from another time. I mean, it seems to me your your one of your main objectives is to create anxiety in the reader. Yes. And you do a really good job of it. Do you think that... Uh, the archaic voice helps you achieve that, to, the set, that alien sense that yes, you bring out? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Now, I know that you're definitely a New England writer. Uh, you live up in Tiverton now. I'm not sure if you're from Tiverton, but <clears throat> you certainly have a unique view of New England because if you read your stories, you'll find that nothing is safe. The house isn't mm. safe. Uh, the beach isn't safe, especially. Um, roads, uh, cemeteries especially are really dangerous. Even furniture is dangerous. Yes. Now, though, have you really felt that kind of sense of fear and paranoia living your life in Newport and Tiverton? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Um, I would say not really. However, I have lived in a lot of haunted houses on the island and I've had a lot of supernatural experiences mm -hmm. over time and in fact I keep saying that these are all works of fiction which is mostly true but there are some of these stories three in fact that are inspired by supernatural events that I lived through mm -hmm. you talk about the furniture for example um, the one story in this volume is called in the chair of nightmare and that is about a chair that has an entity of some kind attached to it. And that was one of the ones that was inspired by reality. 